In the first part of this video on foreign aid, we talked about why it has failed miserably when it comes to promoting development, and why it has at times been even counteractive. This time we will take a different approach and talk about what Mojo and Easterly got wrong. Then we will look at the rise of China on the international stage, and what impact that has had on foreign aid. Proving that aid has not worked is fairly straightforward. If a nation or region has received a notable share of aid money, and economic growth has not occurred, you can be fairly certain in establishing the ineffectiveness of the aid. Of course you can always counteract by saying that maybe the nation would have been even worse off if there wasn't for the aid. But overall this feels like quite a poor argument. By definition the goal is not to hold status quo, but to achieve a proper development. It should of course be noted that aid is generally given to the nations with the heaviest challenges. Meaning that in some instances, the argument that they would have been worse off without the aid is probably holding some truth to it. Proving that aid has worked though, that is much more difficult. How do you distinguish between what development was inevitable anyway? What role did the free market play? A strong capitalist supporter could even argue that the development could have been even faster without the aid. In general, the problem is that we do not have any control groups, and we never really could. Of course, if we set up an experiment with two similar villages and pumped aid money into one of them and not the other, and observed for a decade, there would be lessons to learn from that. And we have, but on a larger scale, we do not have control groups. And even if our experiments showed clear differences, could we be certain that those are applicable to other villages, with other geographical conditions, with other cultural, political or economic conditions? Sure, we can compare nations that have received aid with nations that haven't, or nations over time where the levels of aid have fluctuated, and compare the outcomes. We have, but the question is always how much we can take from those comparisons. There are so many factors that impact the development of a nation, especially over time that to pinpoint the exact effect of the aid program is fraught with difficulty. I'm not trying to say that we can never know if aid is or has been successful. There is no doubting the fact that foreign aid has been wasteful in many instances through its now 80 odd year history. The cases that we mentioned in part one of dictators upright stealing the money, ineffective programs and extensive loan programs driving nations to bankruptcy cannot be overlooked. But we should also note a trend here. While the intent on paper has mostly been to promote development to people in need, to reduce poverty and to promote economic development, and an integration into the global economy, how certain can we be that these very best of intents really has been the true ones in all instances? During the Cold War, a lot of money going to low-income nations from, for example, the US and the Soviet Union was disguised as aid when the purposes were far from that philanthropic. Aid was used as a tool for aligning nations with an ideological direction, and maybe even more importantly, to keep nations from aligning with the ideology of the enemy. Aid money with this intent was not given with many strings attached when it comes to promoting human rights and reducing poverty. Former colonies are much more likely to receive aid. We tend to give to smaller nations where the impact is clearer, rather than to India or Nigeria, where the specific donation is more difficult to track. We have had the tendency to give food aid using food from our own farmers, supporting ourselves in the process, possibly also securing the political support from an important group of voters. We tend to give more to democratic nations, whether those use the money more efficiently or not. We have also seen aid with very strict restrictions, like the US demanding that a large share of its aid in the fight against HIV AIDS in Africa go into programs supporting pro-abstinence, and definitely not to any programs allowing abortions or counselling. Western nations are often criticised for demanding too much for sending aid, and certainly that was a legitimate criticism during the age of the structural reforms in the 1980s. 
but especially prior to that, and to some extent after that, aid, not the least in the form of loans, has been given without any demands whatsoever. Leading to what we saw in part one, dictators financing their military and their own personal consumption, rather than their population. And at the end, nation after nation defaulting their payments and succumbing to heavy debt burdens for decades. If there is one person aid skeptics often criticize, it is economist and UN special advisor Jeffrey Sachs. Sachs has for a long time been a promoter of the idea of a poverty trap and the need for a big push. In a short summary, the concept of a poverty trap points to nations unable to take those first few steps out of extreme poverty. That poverty feeds poverty. That poor yields result in poor nutrition, that results in higher level of disease, and so on in a vicious cycle. To get out of it, a large push is required, where several or all of these problems are tackled at the same time. With a large enough capital injection, people or nations could make necessary investment that would jumpstart a positive economic spiral. Much like finding a correlation, positive or negative, between aid and development is difficult. Finding sound numbers supporting the existence of a poverty trap, or the lack of it, is also difficult. Depending on what measures you use, what nations you look at, what times you focus on, and maybe most importantly, what external factors you choose to disregard, you will get different answers. But there is for sure an interesting development that we have seen in the last two decades, most notably in Africa. With large improvements in health, in combating the communicable diseases, we have also seen sharp upturns in economic development. We know of course that there is a connection between disease burden and development, and so to disregard that aid can and have helped in reducing for example the spread of malaria, and that this has coincided with economic development seems purposefully ignorant. An important, though often overlooked aspect, is how aid is interacting with other policies. Like how well are we supporting agriculture in low-income nations, if we at the same time heavily subsidize our own farmers. We saw in our videos on the development of Africa that the yields are much higher in Europe and the US than in Africa. This is partly due to a heavily subsidized agriculture in the West. In some ways, the African farmers should have the upper hand. They have lower wages and lower costs of living and lands with a great potential for farming. On the other hand, we have economic power to support the use of fertilizers and the irrigation. And we have with subsidies developed a highly industrialized agriculture that produce five or six times as much per acre. And with that, we win all the time. Despite the heavy pushes for a free global market, we often ignore that when it negatively impacts our own industries, not only for agriculture products. Protectionism in the form of tariffs and quotas from the West is still limiting the possibility of companies in low-income nations to export. On top of that are migration policies, environmental policies, security policies, and how protective we are of sharing technological advances also impacts. If drugs against basic diseases were available to low-income nations to the same extent as to high-income nations, we could see faster improvements in health. If research resources were allocated to tropical diseases to the same extent as to diseases impacting high-income nations, we could see faster improvements in health. Overall, there are many sorts of policies that impact the possibility for poorer nations to develop and the general relationship between richer and poorer nations than just aid flows. And by focusing too much on it, we are doing ourselves a disservice. Also, we have a tendency to overlook how small the global aid flows really are. It sure sounds like a lot of money when we say 190 billion US dollars in aid in 2021. And especially when you paint the picture that we have been bombarding Africa with aid money for decades. But this firstly fails to see money going in the other direction. Like Tom Burgess points to in the eluding machine, in 2010 the value of the fuel and mineral exports from Africa was seven times as big as the aid money flowing into the continent. Global remittances, money sent from individuals to family members or similar in one's home country, was over $600 billion in 2022, way higher than the global foreign aid. 
like William McEskill points to in Doing Good Better, the United States buys cosmetics for more money every year than they send in foreign aid. Globally, the cosmetics industry is valued at twice the amount than the foreign aid from the West is. And I'm not saying that buying cosmetics is morally bad and that we should put that money into something more useful. But it is an interesting thing to consider when comparing to public perception of how big foreign aid budgets are. A 2010 survey in the US put the average estimation of how large part of the federal budget was allocated to foreign aid at 25%. Most people agree that it should be lowered, with an appropriate level on average being 10%. In reality, it is less than 1%. Let us also briefly look at the role of China in Africa. Starting a couple of decades ago, China has financed many infrastructure projects in Africa under a pretext of foreign aid. The aid has been in form of a combination of grants, discounted loans and loans at market rates. It has similarities with Western aid in many ways, but in some crucial ways it differs. The Chinese loans has less strings attached when it comes to demands for equality, freedom of speech, the press, democratic elections and so on. Considering China's poor track record on these issues, it might not be the biggest surprise. And this way, the Chinese loans has been favored by many African nations. Close to 40 of them have received some aid from China by now. Aid that has financed ports, airports, railways, power plants, roads, stadiums, governmental buildings and tourist attractions all over the continent. Now, depending on who you ask, you will get drastically different answers on how to view this development. Let us start with the criticism. Many of the negative aspects of Western aid in the past can be seen here too already present or looming in the distance. China is for sure putting political pressure on African nations to align with China on issues like the China-Taiwan relation and the situation in the Xinjiang province, areas where the Chinese regime is benefiting from international support. The projects are most often built with Chinese labor, sometimes all the way down to the least qualified positions, sometimes with just Chinese supervisors meaning that the benefit to the receiving nation's economy might be limited. In some projects, significant corruption has clearly been involved. And since most loans from China to Africa is made using commercial banks rather than governmental agencies, there is much more discretion compared to loans from the West. This has also led to worries that China is forcing poorer nations into a debt trap, intentionally or not and that this situation could lead to Chinese takeovers of African assets like ports and airports, like we have seen in Sri Lanka. But if you ask others, not the least if they are critical of Western aid practices, you will get a different view. China is providing much needed money to many African nations that are lacking in proper infrastructure. And with less demands of political or economic change, the receiving nations have more freedom to develop with regards to local conditions, rather than be cast in a Western developmental mold. It is hard to argue that China is providing aid to Africa in a long-term plan to seize and conquer the African economy. In many ways it is probably positive with more sources of lending and grants for poorer nations. Hopefully this can help assert pressure on the Western nations to improve their aid. But of course China deserves criticism when it is ignoring human rights records, running the risk of forcing nations into a debt trap, buying political influence or silence or is involved in plain corruption. Just because we in the West are guilty of doing all of the above throughout history and that our aid programs today are far from flawless does not mean that we should turn a blind eye to others repeating our sins. Let us look at what aid is doing in some of the larger recipient nations. In 2020, Syria received the most foreign aid from the West. This is what the money is doing according to USAID the agency responsible for distributing the aid budget of the United States. USAID financed food programs reaching over 6 million people in Syria and refugees outside Syria. USAID financed health services and the re-establishing of hospitals, health training and education and medical equipment. It financed access to drinking water, sanitation facilities and irrigation for agriculture. The re-establishing of electricity lines and power stations seeds for wheat production, and providing help in combating the COVID-19 pandemic. Number two on the list is Bangladesh, where USAID helps finance food security to refugees, improved resilience against natural disasters, namely cyclones, and lessen the risk of diseases after a disaster. 
the goal is for Bangladesh to reach middle income status within a couple of years. In Ethiopia, USAID finances food security and the work to increase agricultural productivity. The strengthening of the judicial system, the educational system, create jobs and promote gender equality. USAID finances projects to improve the access to drinking water and to tackle the drought that has brought on a famine on the Horn of Africa in the last couple of years. In Afghanistan, the USAID has been mostly focused on military support and governments. But USAID also finances disaster relief after earthquakes and floods in the last year. It finances programs to help girls stay in school after the Taliban takeover, help to refugees within the country, and health services to the population. And on and on the list goes. This was just a look into four nations from one donor nation. And the point here is not to dress up foreign aid in fancy words and display everything that is good about it on paper. There are programs mentioned here that will have poor results, due to outside factors or to the program itself. But it is also to highlight that among all talk about aid given as political bribes, aid disappearing to corruption and aid failing to reach its goal, there is still a humanitarian strain that runs through most of the programs. And the transparency has improved. Most aid agencies in the West are very transparent today and are run by people with the best intent that work hard to make sure that our money does as much good as possible. And many programs are very specifically designed to help with what almost all of us think we should do, even the most hardcore critics of foreign aid. Disaster relief after natural disasters and war, providing food and agricultural assistance to the most vulnerable people, improving access to education, improving access to healthcare, vaccinations and knowledge about diseases. One simple answer to all this is that we don't know anything. We have no idea if aid can be useful because studies point in all directions. But I think there are some conclusions we can draw and hopefully steer away from looking at foreign aid with such polarizing glasses in the future. We can be sure that if you build grand infrastructure projects in poor nations and don't finance the upkeep, it will be of no use in a relatively short period of time. We can be sure that if you give massive loans or grants to governments in far from democratic nations, you will most likely feed into corruption and possibly help dictators stay in power. We know that if we give aid without any demands back, other than aligning ideologically with the giving nation, it is not a recipe for development. We can be sure that demanding nations to change everything on paper as to imitate the giving nation as much as possible in exchange for aid will not ensure any real change. We also know that treating all poor nations as the same hinder us from seeing differences and tackling problems efficiently. We know that a large share of the aid we have given has been ineffective or misused. But we also know that aid has shown to work at times, and it helps if we consider other policy as part of the work towards progress. In terms of economic policy, trade regulations and more. Aid has helped in terms of lessening the disease burden on poorer nations. And most nations have seen good economic development during the last couple of decades. Aid is not responsible for all of it, but it has helped some of it. Your personal view on foreign aid will be shaded by your ideological stance. Someone believing in free markets and that capitalism is the ultimate catalyst for development. will have problems with foreign aid, no matter how you construct it. But when it comes to it, even the richer nations today are all socialist to some extent. Most people believe in government support to poorer people, even if that support doesn't always get used for the perfect investment ensuring future productivity. We know that people are people and will not always be perfect, and we can still have faith in the system. To some extent we must have the same stand on foreign aid. Of course, we should try to ensure that the programs are as effective as possible, but demanding that they always work, and that every failure means that we should scrap the whole idea of helping, that can never result in anything short of a complete stop. And even the experts on different sides stand closer than you might think, just from reading the basics. Both Mojo and Easterly say that aid can work at times, and Sachs agree that aid never was intended to be long term.
ends the whole idea of the big push. A at first glance very easy solution to the uncertainty in the effectiveness of projects is to demand more documentation. To demand aid agencies to actually prove their programs work. And when you visit their websites you are bombarded with documentation and thorough breakdowns of every single penny. But this comes with a cost. Both of course in administrative cost for the agency on the giving end, but also as a cost for the agencies at the receiving end. Agencies in receiving nations basically don't do anything else than document and cater to visitors from giving nations, forcing some nations to actually stop visits during some months to, you know, actually work with what the money is intended to do. At a glance, aid money can easily be seen as a waste. It doesn't take much knowledge of the sums involved and corruption to be negative to the whole concept. But much like we saw in the breakdown of some of the larger recipients of aid in the world, it is hard to argue against individual projects. Much has changed since the 1970s and 80s, and the answer is not to keep pouring bucket of money after bucket of money upon poorer nations. Nor is it to stop giving. The answer is always somewhere in between. This has been a long-awaited project of mine, and I hope I have done it justice over these four videos on development in Africa and foreign aid. If you haven't seen them all, you can find them on my channel. Thank you for watching and supporting me so I can continue to make videos like this. Every subscription, like and comment helps me along greatly. I will see you in the next one.